This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 217, recorded on January 25th, 2013. Hello everyone, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIV the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Columbia University, Dixon de Palmier. Hello, Vincent. I don't know what to, where to say you're from. <laughs> well, you where know, are you from? From? Outer space? From, hmm, we don't Fort we don't Lee, New Jersey, Fort but you're Lee. here in my office. This is true. Welcome back, Dixon. Thank you, Vince. Welcome back, Cotter. <laughs> You've been well, in New Zealand, eh? I have. Did you like it? It was great. Okay. You can't talk anymore. Okay. Also joining us today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. How's it out there in the West? Good? Cold. Really, really oh, yeah. cold. Uh, Dixon's gone. Oh. <laughs> He's left. <laughs> it has been brutally cold this week, hasn't it been? Yeah. Yeah, this morning I... Um I looked in my freezer just to check the thermometer in there, and then I looked at the thermometer outside, and I confirmed that they were, in fact, the same reading. <laughs> Which was? Uh, zero Fahrenheit. Zero Fahrenheit. I think it's yes, below that's zero minus, here. That's minus 20 C. Minus 20 C. Oh, it's colder than us. Here in New York City at the moment, it is minus 6 C. Oh, it's warmed up now. Uh, yeah. Let's see what we have now. It is now, um, yeah, it's minus 6 C here, too. And so it's been all week. What does it get to at night there? Uh, it was it was probably around zero because I, I looked at the thermometer first thing in the morning, so it was probably around zero, maybe maybe minus one Fahrenheit, something like that last yeah. night. Pretty cold. Yeah. Also joining us today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi, fellas. Hey, Rich. How you doing there? I'm great. You're probably warm, right? Yeah. You guys sure you want to hear this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. Sure. <laughs> it is 72 Fahrenheit, 22 Celsius. Nice blue skies, few puffy clouds. <laughs> I think I prefer the weather updates from Rich during hurricane season. Yeah. I did a podcast with Stan Malloy yesterday, who's in San Diego. Oh, yeah. And he wow. said, oh, the weather's terrible. It's cloudy and 68 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> and it hardly gets any better in San Diego. That is just a beautiful place to live. Have you lived there? Uh, I have visited frequently. I have not lived there, no. Mm. And my uh, my daughter lived there for a while, so. It is a bit crowded, though. Yeah, it's crowded. Now, look who's talking, me, you know. Crowded. Yeah, <laughs> Very yeah but San Diego too. has an excuse for being crowded. It's yeah, gorgeous. Nice weather, yeah. All right, today uh, we are going to talk about flu vaccines. I thought that would be a good idea. What do you think? I think it's a great idea. Yeah, about, uh, it's about the right time of year to do that. Yeah, yeah this yeah. is a public service twiv. Yes, and uh, Dixon actually says it. It's really a f virology one hundred and one in some ways, but yeah. it's going to be more yeah. casual. Um, I had been getting a few emails about flu vaccines, so I thought we should chat about them. So before we do, I have to complain. You guys may have seen this headline in the New York Times yesterday: "Research to resume on modified deadlier bird flu." Did, did you know that the Kawaoka and Fouché H5N1 viruses passed through ferrets were not only modified but deadlier? No. No. I didn't know that. That is untrue. I don't think they knew that. This is an article by Denise Grady. The article itself is actually balanced, but the headline writer really went over the top, in my opinion. This is horrible. The same article was picked up by a Minnesota newspaper, and they used essentially the same headline. This, this is just a, awful. This is a very, very common problem in science reporting. Uh, Alan, when, when, once the headline writer does uh, their bit, does the actual author have any opportunity to say, wait a minute? Depends on the publication. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the deal is at the New York Times. Um, since I write for monthlies and uh, occasionally a weekly magazine, I um, I usually get a proof of the article ahead of time because they have the time to do that. If you're working for a daily and you, the deadlines are measured in minutes, mm, probably not. I've it's written like two articles for 
online things. Like one was for a Discover blog, and the other was from for something else. And they did the headline. I had no say. They never asked me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's fairly typical. Yeah. Um, I uh, I usually put headlines on mine, and they usually get kept. Um, but that's just because of the publications and the editors that I work for. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's really irresponsible. You know, it's I terrible. understand the motivation, but it's really irresponsible. Yeah, I mean, people read this and go, "Oh, yeah, those guys were working with bad stuff," you know, right. and then they they go away thinking this is bad. And no matter what you say, all they think of is this headline. I think it's really bad. The rationalization that um, that editors tell themselves when they come up with these sensationalist headlines when they don't exactly match the story is, well, we're just getting attention with the headline, and then people will actually read the story. But I think that ignores the reality of people walking past a newsstand and they see the headline and they don't bother to read the story. Yeah. You know, a lot of people get their science news that way, I'm sorry to say. And so yeah, sure. you're, you're actually, it, it does actually do real damage. And I wish that, uh, that that sort of thing would stop, but I don't see any hope that it's going to. Well, we probably, uh, as responsible scientists, ought to complain to the publications, write them a letter. Yeah, that usually doesn't go far because they don't want to be criticized for their headlines. I guess. So also, yeah, that the headlines there to sell the paper. Mm-hmm. Sure. You know, and the the sad truth is that that's that headline is more likely to sell the paper than uh, research to resume on H five N one flu. Right. Unfortunate. Yeah. That's why we don't sell too many twivs, right? Because we just tell the truth. Yes. But we, plus, we just give them away. Right. Yes, that, that too. <laughs> but we do have catchy headlines. However, they are not incorrect. Right. Right. I so I started teaching my virology class uh, on Wednesday. I have 190 students this year. Wow. <laughs> so I, as part of the first lecture, I said the reason I'm doing this, not just to teach you virology, is that you can look at headlines and look in news on, on news reports and know when it's wrong. And I put up a headline on CNN from a couple of years ago that was all messed up. So on Monday, I'm going to go in with this headline and show them, see, gee, it's still happening. How many students were there the first year you taught this class? 30. Right. It's the fourth year. So, you know, word gets around, as one of right. the students said, hey, people on campus know this is a fun course. So Great. It's the subject matter, you know. Viruses Perfect. are just compelling. They're cool. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. So we're going to have a good semester. Good. All right, we have a follow-up from last time from Mark, who writes, Dear Twiv Team, as a longtime listener and fan of your podcast, I was happy to hear that one of the topics covered in episode 216 was splicing. Actually, it was the only topic. Splicing, as you discussed, is an important process that can create diversity in many genes. However, I also wanted to point out that splicing can help viruses keep track of the time. This is the conclusion of my recent manuscript published in Cell's new open access journal. Cell reports. The manuscript describes how the complex timing of flu can be coordinated with only a few components. In short, a poor splice site in NS1, that is non-structural protein number one, results in the slow accumulation of NEP, the nuclear export protein. As NEP accumulates over time, the virus switches from transcription to replication and packaging. The mechanism is both simple and incredibly elegant. In studying the relationship between NS1, the interferon antagonist, and its spliced partner NEP, I found that NEP levels are more essential to flu virus replication than those of NS1. Decreasing NS1 levels to greater than 80% by microRNA targeting had no detrimental effect on virus replication or its ability to antagonize the cell's response to infection. Given the fact that it was unlikely that a virus would waste such resources, I instead focused on NEP as the balance between these two proteins are linked by splicing. For every 10 NS transcript, the virus makes one NEP. To this end, I found that altering levels of NEP had a dramatic impact on fitness. Altogether, I propose that the slow accumulation of NEP during virus replication coordinates the timing of the overall infection, providing influenza with a molecular timer. This work is receiving a lot of public interest, and he provides a couple of links to NPR, BBC, and ABC uh, uh, reports on this. But none of these stories cover the real science in the paper, which I am very proud of. In any regard, I thought I would bring this unique utilization of splicing to your attention. 
Thank you for your time, and as always, look forward to the next podcast. Mark is uh, at Mount Sinai here in New York City. I think we should do this paper. Yep, yes. It looks cool. Yes. Yep. Let's look at these headlines to see. Yeah, check that out. Okay. <laughs> so scientists, this is BBC, or NPR, scientists try to thwart flu virus by resetting its clock. Uh-huh. It's not bad. All right, that's okay. Uh, the the uh, BBC... <clears throat> Flu knows when to attack. Well, viruses don't know anything. Okay? Right, exactly. They are passive. Too anthropomorphic. Yeah, thank you, Dixon. You've You're been welcome. listening. Of course. To this week in viral. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> That's wrong. And finally, MSN study shows how flu virus keeps time. Okay, they're not bad, except for the anthropomorphism, right? Right. Yeah, it's not too bad. Right. Yeah. So we'll do this in a couple of weeks, because next week we have... Uh, um, uh, what's his name? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Better to find out since <laughs> he's going to be on. <laughs> oh, I know. He's been on many times. Many times? What's, uh, Welkin Johnson. Oh, well, <laughs> Welkin. Welkin's Good. coming back next week. We're going to talk about some endogenous retrovirus papers. Next. Cool. I don't know if you're here, uh, Rich. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. Um, Actually, uh, you're here, but um, no, you're not here. It's me, Alan, and Welkin. And Dixon. Are you going to be here next Friday? Sure. Yeah. Uh, RC is interviewing. Yes, I am and, not here. I'm interviewing. And Kathy is uh, recruiting, interviewing also. Okay. Well, tell Welkin hi for me. I will. All right. <laughs> Last All right. Time so I we, saw will, Welkin, we will talk about a, this. Last time I saw Welkin, it was in a bar in Boston. Totally <laughs> serendipitously. I heard he bought a, a Volvo. It's a Welkin wagon. Oh, oh no. man. <laughs> It's no good, Dixon. No, I'm sorry, Alan. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll do this I've, I've been away. I've been away. All right, we're going to do this paper on the 15th of February. Okay. Okay. Because you and I, uh, Rich, are going to be having a special TWIV in D.C. on the 8th. Right. Is oh, that on. is that set? It's all set. Should we right. tell people? You should. No. No? You just did. Oh, you want to? Well, well, we didn't we tell people. We didn't say who it was. I don't know. I'll leave it up to you. You're the boss. It's pretty exciting. Come on. Yeah, sure. Uh, what do you think, Alan? Uh, well, I don't even know who it is. So. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to interview Tony Fauci at NIA. Ow! Awesome. Is that good? That's very cool. Yeah, it's great. That is awesome. Yeah, that's cool. Because Rich and I are going to be at study section. Oh, that's great. So here's what happened. Uh, Rich said, should we interview Fauci? I said, well, I'll, I'll see. I'll ask him. It's a good idea. So I asked John Udell because Fauci's his boss. Uh, and John was on a twiv a while ago. Uh, he said, "Great idea!" Yeah, in that voice of his, <laughs> I'll, tr- "I'll try." And he did. He came through. <laughs> That's cool. superb. I mean, several years ago, I was working on a story um, for Nature Medicine, um, and uh, usually when you want to interview somebody at the NIH or the CDC, you know, big it's government tough. organization, <laughs> it's not necessarily tough. But you, it's usually best if you call their press office to yeah. kind of hound That's the right. researcher and get. <laughs> <in it. laughs> That's right. And I was doing this science policy story, and I, um, I, I called up their press office. I said, yeah, I'd, I'd like to – I emailed their press office. Um, you know, I'd like to talk to somebody about this and um, sent that in. And five minutes later, my phone rang, and I answered it. Uh, Hello, Alan Dove. Hi, Alan. It's Tony Fauci. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Hey, what's so, up, Tony? So you, was, <laughs> you interviewed Tony? Yeah, yeah. I t- <laughs> Good. Uh, so, so is this going to be Friday afternoon we're going to do this, Vincent? You bet. Okay, good. Fantastic. I, I'm coming home Saturday in anticipation of this. Great. Fantastic. Right. Yeah, and Terrific. we have to go through security, which takes about 40 minutes, apparently. <laughs> okay. It's all right. So hopefully, uh, yeah, we got to get there by 4, 4.15. All right. Cool. All right. Today we're going to talk about uh, flu vaccines. Yep. And influenza, of course, is a uh, course. respiratory infection, which you have now, Dixon. No, right? I don't. You're sneezing and coughing. I in did my not. I just, I just had to clear my throat. And it uh, occurs in epidemic and pandemic forms. It does. It every does. year. Every year every in the temperate single... climates, like here in the U.S., it's, it's seasonal. It happens in the winter. It's amazing. Uh, in the southern hemisphere, you know, when they're having their winter, which is at the different time of the year they have their flu outbreaks. And interestingly, in, in tropical climates, it happens all year round. Right. Although I think there are some exceptions where it's even seasonal there, so we really don't understand that. We've talked about seasonality here on TWIV, about flu. Now, the big issue with flu is it can kill you. It makes you very sick. 
and it happens at all the every year. So we need a vaccine against it. Of course, uh, it kills old people, young people, and in between. Right. I think in the U.S., anywhere between three and forty thousand deaths a year. Mm. Yeah, right. as many. Right. Oh, actually, as many, if not more, than we uh, kill on the roads driving cars. How right. many yeah. is that? Right, really? Yeah, oh, wow. it's like cars, thirty or forty thousand people a yeah, year. Cars on the roads. are about thirty thousand a year, and flu is. Um, uh, often over that. Yeah, depending on the season, yeah. And yet nobody gets hyper about it. What do you mean? No, it's acceptable. You yeah, know? exactly right. They're used the to that. The cars or the flu? Both. Both. Yeah. Well, if it's not you, <laughs> people don't seem to worry too much. No, but if 10 people die from West Nile virus, they got very excited. Right, it's a big flap. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's the thing so with the flu is people think, oh, it's just a bad cold. Right. Which develops into a... <laughs> And in fact, when people get a bad cold, they assume it's the flu. Yeah. And people die for two main reasons. One is a secondary bacterial infection because you're compromised by the primary influenza infection. And another is uh, actually viral pneumonia where mm -hmm. the influenza gets down into your uh, lower respiratory tract and does the damage all by itself. That's quick. Right. The secondary bacterial infection, you've got a little more time and a possibility of uh, treating it with uh, antibiotics, but the viral pneumonia is quick. Yeah, yeah. And right. you can't do much about it. Nope. So, we, we, I want to talk about these vaccines, and I found a very nice uh, chart on the CDC site, which lists all of the vaccines that have been approved for use in the U.S., for this season, not all of them are available right now, but there are two main types. There's an inactivated vaccine, and there's a an infectious. I don't want to call it a live vaccine, <laughs> but the, That's the right. name. That's right. <laughs> so it's TIV, <laughs> trivalent in, inactivated vaccine, TIV, or LAIV, live attenuated influenza <laughs> vaccine. So it is live. Uh, <laughs> you know, if CDC says it, it must be right. Yeah. <laughs> It ought to be UAIV. That's right. What's undead. Undead. The undead. <laughs> well, I, I'm sure that would allay so many people's fears. <laughs> exactly. How about infectious? I, I really like undead as the solution to this whole conundrum. So you're saying it's a zombie vaccine? Yeah. yeah. Oh, ZAIV. So yeah. Zive. Huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So this this uh, chart is pretty big here. Uh, there are let's see number of manufacturers. Most of them make TIV: Sanofi, Novartis, Glaxo, ID Biomedical, CSL, and okay, those are them. And they have different names like Fluzone, AgriFlu, Fluvirin, Fluarix or Fluarix, FluLaval, Afluria, <laughs> and they're high dose forms, and they come in multiple. Formulations, you know, a single dose pre filled syringe, a single dose vial, a multi dose vial. How are they made? We're going to talk about that. Oh, good. That. Oh, good. Oh, good. And just um, mm. from, the, from the manufacturing perspective, uh, Sanofi is sort of the 800 pound gorilla. Is that right? In this yeah. field. The majority of doses of flu vaccine distributed, um, certainly in the U.S., maybe worldwide as well, um, are from Sanofi. This is, this is, one of their huge products, okay. um, and then the other the other companies um, are smaller players. Um, Medimmune, I think, is probably the smallest. They make the the live attenuated. Right. And it's interesting the that uh, it's interesting that uh, several of these things that are called different things are made by the same manufacturer. <laughs> well, they're the same vaccine in different. <laughs> Formulations, so formulations, the, okay, like plus right, and minus so, adjuvant and that kind of stuff. Uh, well, there are no adjuvanted vaccines in the U.S. The right. FDA has flu not vaccines. flu vaccines, flu vaccines, flu vaccines right? right. Um, th there are no adjuvanted flu vaccines in in the U.S. because the FDA hasn't decided that that's okay. Right. Um, the um, uh, Sanofi is a good example of these. Uh, they have flu zone, flu zone high dose, and flu zone intradermal. The only difference between flu zone and flu zone intradermal is the needle. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the intradermal is a, actually a really cool technology. It's it's one of these new um, uh, tiny dose just under the skin micro injection systems, mm. um, and the high dose is just a higher concentration for um, especially for elderly patients. The thinking is that giving a higher dose may stimulate a more robust immune response. Do any of them make uh, nasal sprays? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's flu the, mist. Uh, okay. mist. Flu mist. Flu mist. Which is the uh, right. infectious vaccine LAIV. It's made by Metamune. 
which right, and that one's goes, unique. That one's in your so, nose. Yeah, right. We'll talk about how they're made. I just want to point out that um, so the ones that come in multi-dose vials have mercury in them. All right, they have twenty uh, specifically thimerosal. Yes. yes, and they list the mercury content here: micrograms per half mil dose. You know, you get about twenty-five micrograms. It's less than in two bites of sushi. Yeah. Just yes, it's it's less than you breathe from coal-fired power plants. Correct. Um, and it's also in a different form from the toxic form. Sure. So this is this is exactly. ethyl, ethyl mercury versus exactly. methyl. Exactly. And that's there, of course, so that bacteria won't grow in the vial because if you put it back in the fridge after dipping into it, it could yeah. happen, right? Right. It could happen. So these vaccines are also recommended for different age groups. So some are from 6 to 35 months, for example, greater than 36 months, uh, greater than 18 years. The uh, flu mist is only licensed for between 2 and 49 years old. So that's another distinguishing. So yeah, I go to the airport, like Chicago, uh, you know, O'Hare Airport, and there's a free flu vaccine injection at this, this counter over there. Free? Free. It's free. Yeah. Really? And you walk over to it, and mm -hmm. do they are they aware of these uh, different formulations yes, sure and everything? Sure. Yes, they are. In fact, um, when you go to um, – I don't know if you see the paperwork when you go to every flu clinic, but certainly the ones I've been to, they fill out the, the form and they say which arm they gave it to you in and they say which product they gave you. Okay. Yeah. Well, I would take, that's a lot uh, to keep track of. I yeah. would take the uh, flu mist myself, but we'll talk about that hmm. in a moment. All right. So those, those different kinds. Um, you might be interested to know what are the um, – how many doses are – distributed each year so the cdc keeps a page on that it's called seasonal influenza vaccine and total doses distributed this is in the u.s or this is worldwide? in the this is in the u.s u.s right. licensed manufacturers yeah right. and so currently with the projection is 145 million doses are to, are going to be made this season and so far as of January 18th, 133.5 million doses have been distributed. Now, it doesn't mean they've been given to people, right? right. They've just been put out there. Is there a way to know that also? I, I, I would think so. Because um, that's, isn't that the way they uh, look at early onset uh, epidemics? By the use of the vaccine, because people rush off to get it, and therefore there's a rise in the number of people there's a vaccinated, <clears throat> and therefore you know that the epidemic has started. No, yeah, they, I, they have other ways of looking at. Well, that. I'm sure, but yeah. Go ahead, this Dan. is this is um, this is actually kind of difficult to track because of the way the vaccine is distributed through so many different channels. Yeah. Um, the um, I go to a meeting each year, the uh, the National Influenza Vaccine Summit, um, uh -huh. which <laughs> uh, I and N V S N I V S yes, um, <laughs> and uh, I I do their meeting reports for them, but uh, wow. Um, it's it's a neat meeting to go to because it it's a lot of presentations about not not just the virology of it but really the whole public health effort that goes into distributing this mm -hmm. massive amount of vaccine in a very short time frame. Um, it's not too hard to track uh, how many doses it were manufactured because of course you've, you've got six manufacturers and they all by law have to keep good records of of what they did. Um, so you can. You can tell that the trouble is the distribution system for this goes through multiple middlemen, right. um, and there's not a really easy way to do it differently. So it goes from the manufacturer to several distributors. Um, then the distributors may be sending it to uh, Department of Defense. They may be sending it to your local public health clinic. They may be sending it to uh, CVS or Walgreens, um, and those those end destinations are where the doses actually get delivered right um they don't all have compatible databases well, uh, so so that raises another question of course after the flu season after everybody's recovered after the transmission is down what happens to the unused doses of vaccine they mm -hmm. generally get returned to the manufacturer and when would you elect to uh, do that if you were like Dwayne reed Probably sometime in the spring, late spring. Uh, so they, at, after, there, there's sort of a post-mortem on the previous season at this annual flu summit that I go to. Okay. Um, and they go through, you know, we, we calculate that this many doses were actually delivered because we got this type of return rate. Right. Uh, and there are also, there are populations where we have impeccable records. Department of Defense 
they get they get virtually 100% coverage mm -hmm. of their employees because their employees who refuse vaccination go and get <laughs> Place called Fort Leavenworth, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, and you know and, which insurance company covers their injection rates, too, don't you? No. It's Geico. Yes. Do you know what Geico stands for, Vincent? No. It stands for Government Employee Insurance Company. Okay. Isn't that interesting? But is it a private company? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And but they insure all of the federal employees, mm. so they're covered for this injection through that plan. Isn't that, that okay. that's a wonderful well, little bon mot? <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Or bon mat. <laughs> yep. And when when the vaccine doses are returned, then the then you could get a count about how it's right. used, right? Right, right, right. Uh, uh, although you're, you know, there's always going to be some breakage. There's going to be yeah, some sure. transit, but you can you can get reasonable estimates of how many were. Um, That's very yeah. interesting. Hmm. So no no um, no pharmacy has on stock after the epidemic any flu vaccine. Uh, not true. Many pharmacies will still have it. Many doctors' offices will still have it. Right. It's just a question of what the policy is there, right. on okay. how long they keep it sitting around. They get no rebates from the companies they bought them from if they send them it back? Generally, it depends on the deal that they've worked out with the distributor in the company, yeah, but yeah. they are generally going to get a rebate on on unused doses, okay. rated some way, and... Um, yeah. you know, that'd, that, be a, that'd be a great way to keep track of how much was used, because... Every company so would want to get some return how, on their investment. Yeah, in fact, the pharmacies probably do a better <coughs> job than the doctor's offices on this. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Because they are private businesses, <laughs> right. and they need uh, to right. really right. keep track of where everything went and what they spent money on. Um, whereas practices, especially small private practices, are supposed to function as businesses, but they're run by people who are not really trained as business people. Right. Uh, which is not a criticism. <laughs> of no, but you're they, absolutely right. They have priorities, and they tend not to <laughs> rigorous track of, of yeah, all yeah, the yeah. pennies. What's the shelf life of these things? How stable are they? Do we have to keep them cold? And you have to be uh, frozen, yeah. And once, frozen. You, once you thaw them, you have a certain time uh, in which you have to use them. I right. see. It might be on the package insert. Um, okay. So what happens to the vaccine that causes it to become inactive? Yeah, it becomes inactive. Well, how? <laughs> I know. I'm raising I'm a being question. You silly. <laughs> no, you're not. You're always like that. <laughs> well, if it's the infectious uh, virus, it's losing infectivity. Yeah, but I'm asking right. a question. What does it mean when you've got a purified virus in a vial with uh, thymol, uh, thymol? Well, no, it doesn't always have. Well, if it's multi-dose, yeah. Then what causes it to go bad? By the way, the the one you put in your nose is not ever with thimerosal because no. those are single form; those are single administration uh, pre-filled syringes. I see. Okay. Why does it yeah. lose infectivity? Yeah, there's nothing else in there except the virus particle and water. Well, if you if it's kept at room temperature, it's it's warm and the virus is falling apart. Yeah, the proteins will spontaneously denature the. Lipids all, oh, okay. you know, I'm saying keep it in, keep them, you know, no, keep it in the refrigerator. You seem uh, skeptical, Dixon. What's the shelf life inside the refrigerator? That would be described on the package insert. Right. Yeah, which, I, which I'll provide those uh, the, links to for the, everyone. The problem but. with the concept is that there's only one way to test out to see whether or not it's still effective, and that's to give it to people to prevent infection. Well, right. What you could do. <laughs> so my other question is, how many people who die from influenza every year were actually vaccinated? Uh, that that's, year? We'll we're get gonna, to that. Yeah, later. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. We'll get to that. All right, later. I'm jumping ahead right. here. What the, what the manufacturers do, I think, is some simple biochemical experiments to determine how, can you leave this thing sitting Stability in the refrigerator for a couple of hours, and they'll come up with some kind of maximum time range for that, and then they'll cut it way back and say, okay, to be safe, don't let it sit for longer than this. And all of these vaccines. I'm, I'm now playing the, the NPR host that knows nothing about this. The, the, all of the vaccines that you've described are intact viruses with the genome inside. No. We'll get to that. No, the ones you've already described here. <clears throat> no, we'll get to that. Oh, I see. The, the, live, the infectious, of course, is an infectious but intact, but the others are not. We'll, we're going to talk about that. All right. I just noticed on the package insert for flu zone, ah. it says store all flu zone and flu zone high dose at 2 to 8 degrees, so it's not frozen. Right. Do ah. not freeze. Discard if vaccine has been frozen. Uh -huh. so that may apply to all of them, in fact. It says basically the same thing. I was just looking at the um, uh, Agri-Flu one. Uh, same thing. 
basically uh, store it plus two to plus eight C, not frozen, protect from light. Right. Don't uh, allow it to reach room temperature before injecting. Do not use after the expiration date, whenever yeah. that is. That right. is uninformative. Yeah. So no freezing, okay? Because polio vaccine needs to be frozen. It's interesting. Very interesting. I assume that this one would also. Measles? Uh, yeah, measles has to be frozen also. Right. Yeah. And once you thaw it, you have to use it very quickly. Correct. All right, the, uh, you might be interested to know what strains are in the vaccine this year. Pray tell. Pray tell. Yeah, lay it on <laughs> me, big guy. <laughs> so uh, typically the vaccine is trivalent. Yeah. It has 2A and a B strain So for the last number of years. So this year we have A California 7 2009. That's an H1N1-like virus. from the- That is the strain that was the pandemic strain. That's right. right. And that has not changed since... The since two thousand and nine are A bird flus? No, no. A is just a, a subtype, right? But don't some right. favor birds and others? No, well, these are human strains. All of them. These are all human viruses that travel from human to human. That's a that's a human virus. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the California one is really interesting because it has not undergone enough antigenic drift since two thousand and nine to justify changing the vaccine. That's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, the other component is an A Victoria 361 slash 2011. That's an H3N2 like virus. This is different from last year, so it's been changed. Okay. And then the final is a B Wisconsin 1 2010 like virus, and that's also changed from the previous year. Which are isolated from patients and then put into vaccine production. Yeah. Right. Now you can see this one is from Victoria, that's Australia, one is from Wisconsin. So. Right. We'll talk about the selection in a moment. I just want to note that a quadrivalent inactivated and infectious vaccine has also been approved by the FDA. They've added – there are two lineage of influenza B viruses that circulate, uh, and um, they've found that both are causing extensive respiratory illness all over the U.S., so they're going to put the second B lineage in the vaccine, so that will give a, a quadrivalent. But that's not available to till the next season. Hmm. How do you select the strains? Exactly. It's basically an educated guess. The WHO has labs all over the world that collect isolates from patients who have influenza. And then they do antigenic characterization by serology, essentially. They sequence them, they do serology, and they try, by the first month of every year, they try and predict uh, what's Mm. going to be Mm. the predominant strain because it takes about eight to nine months to make the vaccine. Uh, so they, the WHO actually has all the reports online. I'll put a link to one of these reports on on how they select vaccine. They basically report the influenza activity throughout the year, where in the U.S., what kinds of viruses are circulating. And, you know, they react them all with a panel of antisera and try and see uh, where the virus is going. And typically here for one of the predictors here in the northern hemisphere are strains that are causing flu in the southern hemisphere in their winter, which, of course, is our summer, so that right. you can sometimes get a heads up on I, that. I must tell you that while I was in New Zealand, I found nobody suffering from flu. Yeah, it's summer down there. Thank God you well, have you said. <laughs> <laughs> and now, basically, this is a global effort. It's right? a global yeah, effort. Yeah, WHO yeah. does the work, a lot of regional lab- and national laboratories, and then they make a recommendation, and then the individual countries decide whether to accept that or not. You don't have to, obviously. Wow. And then the manufacturers can start making virus. Okay. So that's actually, we also had a, a TWIV episode. Uh, mm-hmm. Actually, it was an interview I did with Derek Smith back in 2011. He is involved in this and he talked about it a, a bit as well. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Now, let's talk a little bit about how to make the inactivated vaccine. This is actually a very interesting story. So in the U.S., you know, we got caught with our pants down in 1918. We didn't even know it was influenza virus. And we, we, the virus wasn't isolated until 1933, but the military said, this is ridiculous, you know, a lot of our troops got killed by influenza, so they really provided the impetus to start developing a vaccine. And Jonas Salk was involved with this. This is early on in his career. Uh, he uh, worked on ways to make an influenza vaccine. He grew it up in eggs, and inactivated it with formaldehyde. 
I actually found a uh, a paper of his from um, the Journal of Clinical Investigation from 1944. Tom Francis Jonas Salk et al. And this is from the University of Michigan. So he was at NYU for a while. And then he moved to the University of Michigan. And um, he was one of the first people to develop this approach. And in fact, this was used for many years in the U.S., first in the military and then in the general population. And it's undergone some ev evolution. But when he did it, he just grew the virus up in eggs. He, you inoculate the egg in the allantoic fluid. It grows in the cells lining it, and then you harvest it from them. You get five or so mLs from each egg. And he would just inactivate it with formaldehyde and inject it. That's it. You know, no, no purification or anything. What were the chicken cells? <laughs> I think he probably centrifuged out the gunk. But, uh, and, you know, that, that was used for a while. And then, then in the 60s, the more sophisticated uh, preparations were done. I have a really nice timetable of events. Sidrap put out this report in October of last year on the current state of flu vaccines. And so uh, 1945, first military vaccine, flu vaccine, civilian use, 46. 1960, first recommendation for annual vaccination. So it took a long time to reach that point. That sock paper is uh, really cool because it um, uh, has human volunteer studies. That's right. I, I had that. meant to. It's a challenge. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. <clears throat> Which is what you, you don't do that anymore. Right? No. Flu is known now. We know it's, it can kill you, so you can't do a challenge study. That's why you have to immunize people and see how much flu they get. Right. I've got a. I get. I lecture or used to lecture on flu to the medical students, and I've got a terrific slide from. Uh, it's from Fields actually, that uh, is monitoring virus and uh, symptoms and interferon and antibody after an influenza virus of human influenza virus infection of human volunteers it's just a wonderful study mm -hmm. what i like about it best is that the peak of virus titer has 10 to the fifth infectious units per mil uh in nasal wash mm -hmm. wow i mean <laughs> so that means that there's uh a hundred infectious units in a microliter mm-hmm it's just like a drop you sneeze out, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, well, a, a drop is more like going to be put that YouTube 10, 10 sneezing on the show notes also. <laughs> yeah, I will. Yeah. I have it. I put it on my blog. Did you see yeah. that uh, sneezing video? Oh, yes. It's totally disgusting. Well, I figure a sneeze is probably worth at least 100 microliters. So that's going to be like uh, uh, 10 to the fourth infectious units or something like that. Sure. It's amazing. This, uh, the Australian Health Organization put up a. A, a video of some of people <laughs> sneezing in slow motion, and what I found amazing is just before the spray, all this stuff comes out of their nose. Yeah, yeah, really gross. thick, ropey stuff. Yeah, I didn't know that. The things you find out stuff. in slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> I like their facial expressions and the music that they decided to sing. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Exactly. Um, nowadays, we purify this inactivated vaccine. There are all sorts of so every company does it slightly differently, but basically some they all involve some kind of sucrose gradient purification. Some of them do formaldehyde before sucrose gradient. Some of them do it after. Some of them use other other inactivating agents like uh, UV light, beta propiolactone, and then they all do another step, some kind of detergent, either Triton X100 or... Um, Nonylphenol ethoxylate, sodium deoxycholate, all, all sorts of different detergents, and that splits the virion. And then some companies do another centrifugation and actually highly purify the surface glycoproteins. So there are that's sort of like a subunit version where there's, they get rid of the, the RNA and the internal proteins. So they're all slightly different. So if you don't, so that's the detergent and stuff will. Uh, basically solubilize the membrane. Yeah. And so solubilize the different components. That that would have the effect of uh, inactivating it further. Is that is that the primary reason for doing that, is to inactivate it further, or does it actually make it more immunogenic? Do you know? I don't know, but, okay. you know, the, the, the doses are standardized on micrograms of HA protein. Mm -hmm. 
So it may be uh, that they don't want to put a lot of the other stuff in. I, I just don't know, actually. Certainly purifying it further would make sense. You could maybe purify it, get it more concentrated or whatever. Yeah. All right. Um, I mean, it's a weird vaccine. to be. I mean, it's totally not natural, right? Because it's, it's all contrived. It's, it's inactivated right. with formaldehyde. It's yeah, yeah. detergent, blah, blah, blah. I mean, this is old technology, basically. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And um, Ehrlich would be proud. <laughs> I, I think that, as we'll see, this is part of the reason why it isn't the greatest vaccine that we've ever produced. Anyway, I'll put the package inserts links for some of these guys in the show notes. The package but, inserts are really fun to read. They're cool. They are cool. Yeah. So they're still using eggs, is that what you're saying? All right. So this now recently the FDA has licensed production in cell cultures. All right. But the bulk are still used in eggs. And... Yeah, this is old technology. It takes a long time to make vaccines. Because Vince, eggs, I, you know? I told you I went to Texas and saw a vertical farm that actually made this influenza vaccine in tobacco plants. Yeah, right. yeah. Plants is a good way to do it. So why isn't that on the list of the FDA as approved well, vaccines? Well, it's still in clinical trials. Because the Army actually funded that study. You know, there are 170 flu vaccines in development at the moment. Wow. Throughout the world. And one is using a subunit that has nothing to do with either the uh, H or the A, right? Yeah, some of them are using other proteins, which we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. You yeah, were going to say something, Alan? Yeah, yeah the, the reason um, these, what we would now consider kind of primitive techniques, are still used. Now, this is the, this is the new version, in a sense. It's not, it's not, right. the, um, it's not your grandfather's flu vaccine. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, that's the, the title. <laughs> um, but the reason these things persist is because this is a vaccine that has to be redone from from new strains every single year. Right. And you've got the problems of approving. Anytime you change or add something to a process that's FDA approved, you restart the approval process, essentially. Um, so this is not the kind of product that you want to go re-engineering on the fly because it's mm. already the deadline to make the next batch. Um, and, and that has created a lot of pressure on manufacturers to really not be innovative uh, yeah. You know, yeah, all yeah, these yeah, yeah. pretty much the same way because yeah. it works. it doesn't work well, but it works you know better yeah. than anything else yeah. we've got. <clears throat> I mean, we are moving towards other vaccines, but it takes time. I mean, the cell culture is not a big deal in my view. Yeah, because um, I don't think you can make as much in cell culture as you can in eggs. But we or have plants. to really we need a real game changer. Okay. Yeah, and I think plants. Plants. the key there, the key there has been that these technologies, the growing the virus in cell culture to the point of um, really being able to characterize exactly what's in that culture, um, growing it at tobacco plants, doing these these very advanced subunit vaccines, um, all that technology has now proven itself yep. in other products, and now you can go to the flu pipeline, which, as I said, is constantly running, and so it's harder to change right. but you can you can go to it with these these products that have been tested elsewhere and say okay this strategy has worked well for a lot of drugs right let's use it for this my son has the similar problem he's an air traffic controller and the equipment that they're <laughs> using is 1960s my mom's company actually <laughs> but we the, know how to do this much better the analogy she had <laughs> It's like replacing the interstate highway system without closing any roads exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> Uh, which is tough, right? And uh, you can't risk people's lives by trying out new stuff. So how do you test out new anything which has yeah. people's lives at stake? And this is a good example. Of that. Now, the, the uh, infectious vaccine, the flu mist, is made totally differently. It is produced in eggs, but it is actually, it begins with what's called a master strain which is um, a virus that has several phenotypes that are important. First of all, it's cold adapted. It replicates really well at 25 degrees. I like cold adapted. And Alan did his thesis on cold adapted poliovirus. Did you now? Yeah. Unfortunately, they're not being used for vaccines. <laughs> um, it's temperature sensitive, so they don't grow well at 37 degrees, which is deeper in the tract. So the effect of this is that they're restricted. To the other so they have a, a, a much narrower temperature range where they'll right. grow. Got it. And they're also attenuated in a ferret model of flu. So these were <laughs> selected to be attenuated, and eventually they were tested in people, of course. And, it, and those are three genetically separable right. phenotypes. And they've been mapped to specific segments. And what they do every time they need to make a new vaccine to match the circulating strains 
is they take a current circulating strain and they make a reassortant where the two surface genes, the HA and the NA genes, are swapped into this master virus by genetic engineering, by using um, deriving viruses from plasmids. I'm not going to say the word, the RG word. Ah, right. I'm yes. not saying it. But you didn't. <laughs> and so the, the 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 vaccine in the end, the flu mist, basically has two genes from the circulating strains and all the others from the master donor. So it's a little more complicated. And then you grow that up in eggs and do. Some Initially, when they did it, they actually made reassortants where they would uh, yeah. infect with the master strain and with uh, the strain carrying the HA and NA, and then they would have to select and find uh, the one virus out of two time, uh, two to the eighth. All right, that right. Uh, that had uh, the configuration that they wanted, but now they can do it using, shall we say, recombinant DNA technology. Beautiful. RD? Okay. <laughs> recombinant DNA. I thought that was research and development. And they, this is trivalent also. There's two A's and a B, and a quadrivalent version has been approved. And so you might say, well, is this genetically unstable? Apparently not. They've looked at a number of uh, isolates from patients, and there doesn't seem to be any reversion so far. Yeah. No. Now, the numbers here are much less than the other vaccines, right, Alan? Right. Yeah, this, this is, um, it's been kind of a niche product. It's been, it's been growing steadily, um, but it's more expensive. Um, it's uh, easier to administer, uh, but it's still not, you know, I, I go to the free flu cl clinic that my town has, and that's strictly injected. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you go to your local pharmacy, you probably get the injected vaccine. Uh, the military uses the injected a lot. Um, the only place that I've seen flu mist widely available is the pediatrician's office, and I, I have to specifically request it for my daughter. Yeah. I mean, f uh, Metamune, the, the manufacturer, and they were bought by someone, right? Oh uh, no! They were initially Aviron, okay, and then they that was bought by Metamune. I thought Metamune was bought by someone recently. Uh. Anyway, they own the license for this, so they are the only manufacturers, right? So if it's ever going to be made in greater quantity, they have to license it out, and I don't right. know if they're going to do that. But my my view is this is the oh, they're AstraZeneca. That's right, AstraZeneca. Right, this is the vaccine of choice. This is the one we should be using. Um, as we'll see, it, it seems to work better than the inactivated vaccine. In the population it's approved for, yeah. it works surprisingly well for, I mean, compared to the others. Yeah. There's an interesting uh, trial going on here in Gainesville, actually, yeah. uh, conducted by the Emerging Pathogens Institute, <clears throat> where they're distributing uh, flu mist en masse to all of the uh, elementary schools. Mm. Uh, and getting a, a really high rate of vaccination in the elementary uh, school population and then monitoring uh, the impact of that on the incidence of flu uh, in the general population. Right. The hypothesis being that uh, the schools are an incubator for a spread of flu sure. and that if you, uh, in an organized fashion, can get at the school kids, you'll uh, uh, impact on the spread of flu mm. around. So yeah, that'll be a great idea. how that that's comes cool. out. Yeah. Now, uh, CDC came out very recently with uh, preliminary estimates of the efficacy of this season's vaccine because the season started relatively early. And the match between the, the vaccine strains and the circulating viruses out there is pretty good this year. All right. So in some years, there's a drift already by the time they get the vaccine out. And this year, it's pretty good. So they decided to look at the the match. And so what they do is they have a number of sites throughout the U.S. They enroll people who have reported to a, f a health facility with influenza-like illness. They're enrolled into the study. Uh, they get checked for flu by PCR or cell culture. Okay, so you have a virally confirmed influenza or not. And then whether they're vaccinated or not is determined. So then they can check to see the percent f uh, efficacy. So the study that CDC reported from December 3rd to January 2nd, 1,155 children and adults with acute respiratory infection, 62% vaccine effectiveness. The range was 51 to 71%. Mm. So this is preventing laboratory-confirmed influenza virus infection. It's a pretty huge range, by the way. It is a big, <laughs> is a big range. Yeah. Well, this, the, uh, I found it fascinating the way they do this study because, I mean, you, you have to ask, 
how are you going to recruit people into this study? And the basically the trick is anybody who's got a respiratory infection, yeah. you don't know what it is. That's 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 how you recruit them. And you ask right. them, okay, would you would you join this study? So it doesn't count all of the people out there who never get sick at all. Right. 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 So exactly. uh, I guess the assumption is that the ones who are getting sick in some fashion are a reasonable representation of the general population. Right. So this brought up, and in fact, someone wrote to me about it. Why is it not so great? Why is it 62%? Why isn't it 80% or 90% yeah. if it's a good match? Our other vaccines do a lot better than this. So I, well, I looked at polio. Um, there's a page over at WHO Polio Efficacy. Um, it can be 95% of the inactivated vaccine. Okay. I asked Peter Palazzi. He said, well... You know, these inactivated flu vaccines are trashed with formaldehyde and detergents, and he thinks that really messes up the antigenicity. Even though you get good seroconversion, they're not the right antibodies, and right. he thinks that the uh, flu mist is the way to go. And in fact, the flu mist efficacy is it can go up to 83%, 57 to 93% is the range. Big and range this has there. always been the argument about live vaccines relative to... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, inactivated vaccines. Uh, it, flu mist, you're presenting it uh, in the tissue where you ordinarily would uh, present it, so you're getting uh, a uh, an appropriate uh, immune a mucosal immune response. Mucosal immunity, yeah. The virus is uh, replicating, so you got not only fresh antigen, but all possible antigens. Right. Okay. And, and the same arguments can be made for a lot, uh, most of the uh, live attenuate, live, <clears throat> excuse me, undead attenuated vaccines. <laughs> That's right. Um, okay. It's okay. Uh, relative to the <laughs> uh, uh, killed vaccines. <laughs> so, uh, but of course, you know, the, the live vaccines have their own theoretical drawbacks, some actual drawbacks. Yes. I mean, the, the, the flu mist uh, is really only been tested well in children, right? Right. Um, in other age groups, the results are not great. And I, I corresponded with uh, Nick Kelly over at SIDRAP, and he said, well, you know, the problem is that if you give flu mist to someone who's already been infected with flu, has previous immunity, it, it probably doesn't take. So it's hard to determine the efficacy of flu and other of flu mist in other age groups. But in kids, it looks really good, which is not to say it would be good in everyone, but, you know, who knows? And that's, I think that's one reason why it's approved for ages 2 to 49 or something, um, is the, that that's the population in which it's been shown to work pretty well. Yeah. So um, I don't know if that's the whole story because, you know, IPV, polio vaccine, is formaldehyde inactivated. And it's 95% yeah. uh, effective. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you generally get three doses of IPV. You do. Spread out over a few years. Yeah, so the flu is you get one, right? You get one shot. Mm. So it may uh, it may be it may be a combination of dosing schedule and preparation technique. I, I also think that um, it, you can't compare viruses, right? You know, so even if polio is an inactivated with formaldehyde and it's injected and it's ninety five percent, it's a different virus. I don't think we can compare flu. I do think that, as Rich says, the way to immunize for flu is in the nose. I think that makes perfect sense. The Sabin vaccine <laughs> strains work great. Yep. You take them and they replicate in the right place. Right. But flu mist isn't, you know, Nick said, I don't know why LAIV peaks at 83%. Mm -hmm. You know, why? Why doesn't it do better? Maybe the mutations make it less immunogenic. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, clearly, we need a little more work in this area. A lot more work, I guess. Maybe gut immunity is stronger than respiratory immunity. Yeah. So ba there's a very interesting um, article over at um, SIDRAP. It's a very long report, as I mentioned, that came out last year on influenza. And uh, one of their conclusions, is, and we've actually talked about their work before. We, we discussed one of their meta-analyses of flu vaccine right. efficacy. And, um, you know, the 62% of this season is about in, in line with what their overall estimate was uh, for the inactivated vaccine as well. And they say that um, 
if you look at various seasons and you consider the match between the vaccine and the circulating strains, they say we were unable to identify a clear protective impact associated with a good antigenic match across flu seasons. <laughs> And they said a CDC study looking at the pandemic vaccine in 2009, where the match was perfect, it was only 56% protective. So, you know, we're missing something here. And I, don't, I think that the way the, va- the inactivated vaccine is prepared is part of it, because there's a big difference between the inactivated and the, and the infectious vaccine in terms of efficacy. But there probably is something else that we're, that we're missing. And yeah. The conclusion of that big SIDRAP report is we really need a game-changing vaccine to improve mm-hmm. this. I mean, it, it, it's good and it helps, but we could be doing way better. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially with the technology that we have now. I mean, it, it looks as though we're following the trail of the virus rather than staying ahead of where it's going to be. Because every year's new vaccine is based on last year's epidemic. Right. So that's but, but even in some years you can get a good match. Okay, there's not so, yeah, change. It, it sounds yeah, like and, growing. And the issue is that even when you even when you nail it, like yeah. this year the right. predominant it's strain nailed. is one that's yeah. in the it's in the vaccine. You're vaccinating people against this, and we're getting Still the 62. efficacy. Yeah, right, right. Now we're not saying you shouldn't get flu vaccine. Right, right. So Be- does does that? I mean, it's a, cr- it's a crummy vaccine. You should get it. <laughs> 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 no, but there's another issue here, and that is we're such a heterogeneous population. Yes, And we're absolutely. in immigration-driven that every year you've got different mixes of people in different places, and they respond differently to the same antigens. So you can't expect it to be the same every year unless you're dealing with a place like Iceland or, or New Zealand or some place that's really isolated. Or unless you get a universal flu vaccine. Or unless you get a universal. But then, then you've got immunogenetic differences. Right, but we've got universal vaccines against other polio. viruses. You said polio. No, I, I, I understand. I, I, it's a different virus. It's yeah, you've got to be able to cover the antigenic drift. Yeah. It's a different universal virus. vaccine. Um, yeah, 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 that's right. Uh, but the, the, yeah, it's, it's as vaccines go, it's crummy, but it's the best thing that we have. Sure, I mean. Right, and it's know, better than, it's, it's uh, better. way better than nothing. We're and all, there, we're, is, there is effectively no downside. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the shot hurts a little bit. But if that's if that's the only complaint, um, you know, it's fifty to seventy percent efficacy against getting a disease that could kill you. Um, right. That's you know that's something that's <laughs> worth getting, and it's generally free these days. Yeah. Under the Affordable Care Act, it's covered for virtually everybody. So I, I just wanted to state that every one of us in this uh, room or in this uh, podcast room, a uh, virtual space, has done research. And every one of us has done animal research. And every one of us that's done animal research has been very careful to use inbred sex uh, discriminatory uh, models for our, our uh, whatever we were trying to do to make sure that we got an even response in the host. But life isn't like that. So, oh, absolutely. so you move from the laboratory to the real world and that you've got this problem. And we're doing experiments with humans with this vaccine every year. It's it's a benign experiment, but nonetheless, it's an experiment. But, you know, Dixon, many of our other childhood vaccines work for all Understood. populations. Right. No, I understand that. that. You know, like, so this is weird. This is unusual. Got we, it. But we have to figure it out. So how? Right? The point yeah. is, how do you do that? Well, there are many approaches. Without and, an animal uh, model, how do you do it? Oh, uh, well, that's a problem because whatever you learn in animals in that's terms of host genetics yeah, yeah. may not really. I think you have to look at people who get serious flu and see how they differ. That's a start. Sure. And that, that may help That's you. why my earlier question. But it's also response to an, to an immunogen, right? And that of course. is genetically controlled. And, and we know what that looks like with regards to things like BSA or stuff like that. We this. have to find an antigen that kicks it off in everyone. Correct. Yes. Right. Correct. Or 99% of the Correct. Population. I mean, you, you substitute the word po- polio, not polio, but, uh, you know, um, any antigenic variant of any organism. And, you know, trypanosomes behave this way and, and lots of other things behave this way also. Malaria behaves this way. Uh, every strain is different and it mutates. And, it, you know, life is life. So you're dealing with... An intractable not answer, perhaps. This is not this week in philosophy. Yeah, but come on. L- let me say something here because <laughs> certainly on the virus side of things, I'm... I'm <laughs> All right, let me just mention a few other things here. Um, 
So we said that there are two new flu vaccines approved, but they are not really new. They are just growing the virus in cell culture and then either making flu mist or an inactivated vaccine. So that's not a game changer. No. Uh, there was another new vaccine recently approved. It's called flu block. And this is uh, the HA protein expressed in insect cells huh. using a baculovirus vector. Cool. Right? Cool. And, and that's low uh, temperature too, by the way. Insect cells. Uh, yeah, insect cells. That'll be at room temperature. Basically. And then they, right. um, they, the HA is put in the membrane of the insect cells, so they have to remove it with detergents, and then they purify it with various columns, and uh, then you get relatively pure HA protein. And this has been put through clinical trials, and, uh, you know, the numbers are like 40-some percent uh, efficacy. Probably not significantly different than 62%. Yeah, so we're, we're, back at the same, <laughs> we're back at the same point. That's mad. So what's the advantage of this? You don't need eggs. You can do it really number quickly because all you need is the HA That's sequence, true. right? Yep. Uh, you have to give a lot more antigen because yep. uh, it's just it's not going to cause inflammation. Right. And that's what you need to And get you're not it. allowed to use adjuvants. You can't use adjuvants in the U.S. Right. The uh, so, HA yeah. is a glycoprotein, is that right? Yeah. yeah. So one of the things I wonder is if you make this yeah. thing in insects, if it'll be glycosylated in ah, the same that's... fashion. And if that could yeah. not affect that's the uh, antigenicity. Very good question. I mean, um, apparently they get good seroconversion. It's just that the... Uh, the protection is down. So Nick over at SIDRAP, I asked him about flu block, and he said, I have no reason to believe flu block would be more effective than what we have. It's a pure HA, but we also tend to see pure protein not be as immunogenic. That's why we have three times the antigens in, in yeah. flu block compared to the yeah, regular right, vaccine. Right, right. Like most flu vaccines, they get great serology, but effectiveness is limited. The, the quicker turnaround could be useful. Yeah. Um, that that could get you ahead of a pandemic, and that even with a vaccine that's got middling efficacy, getting ahead of a pandemic with something like that could save a lot of lives. Yeah, but it's not but, a game changer. No, it's not. It's not going to be the end of of the story by any stretch. I my feeling is that the only logical progression for this field is to develop a universal flu vaccine. I agree. Yeah. I agree. One that gives robust multi-strain resistance in most of the population. That's, and that's no longer a fantasy. It isn't. It isn't that's fantasy. really it's a lot of the work on. that's been done on that recently has been very, very encouraging, I think. Yep. Yes. Uh, let's see. what. So I had received an email from Diane. Hello, esteemed Twivers. I have a couple of questions about the flu vaccine. After reading Did you Helen, say steamed or esteemed? esteemed well, thank you. Thank after you. reading <laughs> Helen Branswell's interesting article, how is it that a flu vaccine can be a good match but only have an efficacy of 55%? Huh. So we've well, talked about we that. that. Yeah. And I told her that I thought the denaturation had something to do with it. And so she said, will flu, bo flu block be more effective? And then... Yep. You've heard us yeah. talk about that. And she said, if you do have flu block, could you put all the HAs into that vaccine and immunize people? Right. No, you can't really immunize against all HAs because there are only a couple that are circulating. And then when the other one comes along, it may be totally different from what you put in flu block. So you'd have yeah. to reformulate it every year. So it doesn't make sense to give people something that they don't, they don't need, right? But as Alan said, you might be able to, say, respond to a pandemic more quickly. And that's part of the problem with eggs. You know, we missed the peak of, of disease in 2009 because it took so long to make the egg vaccine. Right. I really like the plant-based yeah. virus-like particles that you yeah, get yeah. by expressing HA. But I bet they're not going to be <laughs> terribly immunogenic because they don't, they don't cause inflammation. They don't have RNA in them, right? They're not going to tickle the dendritic cells properly. Yeah. It's not a game changer. As you said, the, the universal vaccine is a game changer. Diane does bring up um, one good point in the first note. Um, mm -hmm. that's always said that even if the vaccine is not a good match, you can still get some protection and your flu won't be as bad. Um, and that is probably true, but unfortunately it's been very difficult to measure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the SIDRAP article goes through all of that. And in fact, the meta-analysis that we studied, that we talked about that last year. Yeah. Um, the, the, and in particular, the, the numbers in the older population are really hard to come by. Damn. Yes. Um, as they say in the SIDRAP report, a lot of the older studies were done with crappy methodology and, and aren't worth looking at. Now that we're using virally confirmed infection, you know, it's a little better, but we don't have the data yet. 
But I, I mean, I think that as as Diane says, uh, I believe it's better than nothing at all, and always get my flu shot. But I'd like to know why. I suspect <laughs> that you get some protection, so you have an attenuated disease. Right, you still get right. can, can get sick. I mean, you could be protected because you know sixty two percent efficacy. Some people get protected, right. but you might get some virus replication, but lower than normal, and you get less symptoms because you have fewer cytokines elaborated. You know, I guess. And there's besides the theoretical reasons, there is some evidence in the literature that people who do get the flu shot are less likely to die of the flu. Yada yada yada. I mean, then you get all the objections that come to that, well, maybe people who were healthier were more likely to get their flu shot. Um, right. But the, right. That's one of the confounders, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, there's this, this issue because the elderly population is, is a huge, huge question here. And the studies that have been done, it's very, very difficult because they often have lots of confounding medical issues and then which ones got vaccinated, sure. which ones didn't. Um, so... Uh, the the evidence I think I think it's fair it's fair to say it leans toward the idea that even if you get the virus if you had the shot you you may get a less severe disease yeah um, and as I said there's no downside to the shot so well, it's worth getting unless you were in what Norway in 2000 unless yes uh, we'll get to that in a moment uh, Joel is a professor in Arkansas and he wrote saying he was very excited about flu block and he sent links to um to this he said i cut my virology teeth on the baculovirus system he worked with george Rohrman at oregon state so this is exciting news for all baculovirologists it's great to see the insect expression system make it all the way to fda approval with this vaccine of course i think the papilloma va vaccine is also made and one of them is made in insect cells too hmm. he teaches virology at a small college in arkansas cool uh, let's see what else we got here. Okay, so one one last thing from Nick. So um, this Sidrap article, really, really highly recommend everyone have a look at it. It's great. Um, the, they, at the end, they say, "What do we need to do to explore this whole problem of flu vaccines?" First of all, protect broadly protective immunity, universal vaccines. And we don't really have time to go into this today, but some point in the future we'll we'll talk about that in more detail what's the role of cellular immunity i mean all the vaccines we have so far stimulate antibody production but there are known cellular t-cell antigens and maybe those could help people are looking at that what are the impacts of mucosal immunity innate immunity pre-existing immunity we we sort of touched on the mucosal idea that's the best place to uh mm -hmm. to immunize but <coughs> is that really the case adjuvants you know, people <laughs> shy away from adjuvants for flu vaccines in the U.S., but they can be very useful if they really give you a robust immune response. Well, you said in the U.S. What about uh, other statistics from other countries using adjuvants? I was reading the SIDRAP article, and, and they, um, they, they, they say there's really not good data to say whether the adjuvant is really increasing the efficacy or not. They were only introduced pretty recently. Oh, okay. And what is the adjuvant? Uh, a couple of different ones. One of them is... Uh, One's called ASO3, right. which is probably not going to be used in future vaccines, right. I would no. bet. But, um, but there, <laughs> there are that? a few... Is that because well, of the pandemics uh, issue? Yeah, yes. I, think, I think that's probably oh, yeah. not going to be put in future vaccines. No, another one is... Uh, uh, what is it? The oil-based one? Freund's? Not Freund's. No, 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 no. Incomplete. No, it's not incomplete. <laughs> I forgot the name of the other one. Alum? They don't use alum? Well, I think aluminum sulfate was in the ASO4. Oh, no, the ASO3 is squalene based. Squalene based. Yeah, squalene. squalene and uh, tocopherol and polysorbate 80. It actually looks quite innocuous. Right. All right. Actually, I have a, uh, a list of all the adjuvants here. Let me just scroll down. Please Let's play don't. a little bit of music <laughs> while I'm scrolling. What show was that? Uh, Jeopardy. Think Vanna White. <laughs> oh, no, that's Wheel of Fortune. Ah, sorry. <laughs> oh, dear. I searched for adjuvant. And got... And it uh, got appeared on 40 adjunct. pages. All right, ASO3. We don't know what that is. Um, 
MF-59. Whatever that Oil is. and water adjuvant. Oil. That's and, also in Europe. It's probably lanolin or something like that. And ASO-3. Those are the two main ones used in Europe. ASO-3 is also an oil and water adjuvant. Huh. Right. Um, uh, effect, so three studies evaluated ASO-3 adjuvant showed vaccine effectiveness from 60 to 93%. And there are no DNA vaccines at all? Uh, none are licensed. Right. So maybe they're slightly higher. Other three studies uh, use both adjuvants, 66 to 89 percent. So the higher end is slightly higher. Hmm. So the, you know, it's worth looking into. People shouldn't be so negative. But what's right. what's the N on that one? <laughs> the N. How many people did they study? Oh, these are big studies. Hundreds of thousands or thousands? No, or not hundreds, hundreds of thousands. Well, these are these adjuvants are approved in Europe. Yeah. So but uh, yeah, there are thousands of people. A lot of people are have been getting them. All right. So adjuvant is a place for development, but we have to overcome this public negativity. I think that's a big issue. Right. And this, this issue in um, Finland and, I guess, Norway as well um, <clears throat> is going to cast a shadow over that. What's going on there, Ellen? Okay. So what happened was um, one of the vaccines for the H1N1 pandemic in 2009 was a GlaxoSmithKline vaccine called Pandemrix. Okay. And unlike most of the other H1N1 vaccines that were distributed, including all the ones in the U.S., um, this one used an adjuvant. Okay. So ASO3. This used an adjuvant called ASO3. Which is squalene-based. Which is the one we were just talking about. It's the squalene-based adjuvant. Yep. And there were reports of um, some of the kids who got this vaccine developing narcolepsy. Oh, right. Right after they got the vaccine. Oh, now, okay, okay. This okay. is the kind of spurious finding that you say, okay, well, <laughs> so a certain number of kids in a population are going to develop narcolepsy. They got all this, they all got this vaccine. It's permanent it's, narcolepsy or is just it, temporary is it a real? Is there a real correlation here? Right. Um, there have now been a couple of... Uh, fairly large analyses of this data set done. And at least in Finland, it looks like there is a real connection here um, right. between receipt of this vaccine and um, cases of narcolepsy. Now, we're just to get, the, get this in perspective, um, let's see, one of these vaccination coverage of... Uh, so there were 67 confirmed cases of narcolepsy, um, 46 vaccinated and 7 unvaccinated were included in the analysis. Uh, and they found that there was a statistically significant risk associated with the vaccine mm -hmm. um, in developing narcolepsy. Did that stay in the kids or did they recover from it? It is persistent. It is. It, yes, right, it I, appears to have persisted. So now in follow-up studies, okay. they... A lot of these kids still have this problem. Wow. So this has not been seen since 2009, right? No. Does that happened with right. any it other vaccine. It was just associated apparently with yeah. this. Just that one vaccine, just Pandemrix, right. um, just ASO3. And just in Finland and Norway? And, well, Finland and Norway were the countries that got Pandemrix. I don't know how many other countries did. Right. Uh, and they th the statistics that are, I see in this summary uh, article here say that uh, the GSK vaccine was given to more than 30 million people in 47 countries. Wow. Uh, and GSK okay. says uh, just just short of 800 people have been reported developing narcolepsy. So you do the math. 800 yes. out of 30 million. <laughs> this is a very, very rare complication the thinking now seems to be that these are probably people who had some kind of genetic predisposition. Sure, of mm -hmm. course. There seems to be an HLA subtype associated with it. Right, and that would explain Finland. Yes, Because yes, a, right. a genetically homogeneous population. Yep. Um, and this, this looks like it might be real, like it's probably real. Um, it's a vaccine manufacturer's worst nightmare. So ASO3, True. which is the adjuvant in this, consists of squalene, tocopherol, and polysorbate 80. Ah. And the other adjuvant, MF59, is proprietary. Naturally. And those those <laughs> Gee, compounds, you could, you could squalene, that toperafol, <laughs> and polysorbate 80, is, uh, yeah. at least squalene and toperafol are natural products. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, polysorbate 80, I don't know uh, about that. But, I mean, they're... 
uh, you know, they're, from what I can tell, pretty innocuous. So it's it's not clear at all how right. this would happen, but there does seem to be a correlation. Squarely it comes from sharks. This raises, you know, something about risk benefit. I mean, you can't. 30 million versus 800? Yeah, you can't see something this uh, infrequent until you actually start using a vaccine in the population. No, of course, you can't detect this that's in a right. clinical that's trial. Right. That's right. And that that's the, there is a certain risk associated with developing vaccines that uh, stuff like this is going to happen. Yeah. Then you can ask, as is asked in one of these articles, well, was this worth it? Did this really uh, sure. uh, do anything? And they'll sure. say, well, you know, the, the incidence of, of this was, uh, you know, equivalent to the numbers of deaths or something like that. I forget quite what the yeah, numbers were. Yeah. So, in fact, uh, it, it, uh, it, in this particular case, it wasn't worth it. But when the pandemic strikes, okay, you don't know what's going to happen. It turned out that this virus was, uh, was a lot less virulent, a lot less dangerous than people thought it could be. But when it starts, you got to act, and you don't know. It could have been horrible. Have yeah. there been any reports of people? Yeah, let's let's not be Monday morning quarterbacks oh, here. Right. You know, if you if you rewind to two thousand nine, this was a very very scary virus. Yeah. So has has any reports come up that said during the natural course of the infection, some kids also developed narcolepsy? That's an interesting question. I I don't know the answer to that because it hasn't been seen in the U.S. over baseline, right? Where we don't use adjuvants, right? So. Right. right. So as but a as a really interesting to know the the yeah, natural. Yeah. Uh, sure. You know, uh, more about narcolepsy itself and whether infections. This is something that can be triggered by infection in general. Right. There's mm -hmm. a there's a weird aside here. I remember watching a video once of an animal model for narcolepsy, and it occurs in dachshunds. And they showed this little dog running in a circle, and then oh, it yeah. just flops over. Yeah, I think I've seen that. And then it wakes up again and continues to run in the circle yeah. and it flops over again. Now, that's a specific genetic yeah, well, well, that's the point I'm trying to raise here. Maybe these kids have a similar genetic predisposition. Well, yeah. they're, they're right. it's said that there may right. be a uh, Right. But there does seem to so be So how would you know that before you give the vaccine? You wouldn't. You Look, don't. I, I think it's the same with people who die when they get H5N1 infections. Yeah, I yeah, think that's right. They that's have right, some that's right, that's right, that's right. immunological issue, as do many other people who get serious illness from certain infections. Sure, where sure. People don't. So I, I think the listeners are learning now that we don't know a lot about a lot of things. <laughs> the best science raises more questions than answers. <laughs> exactly. Well, and in fact, one of the things that's turning up now that genome sequencing is becoming so cheap, um, yeah, yeah. I just, just covered a talk on this recently. Um, they're finding that as as researchers get a population of patients with, say, uh, myocardial infarction, mm -hmm. um, and they say, okay, uh, we know that there are these rare families where MIs are very common and these people have horrible, horrible heart problems, and they're in, in some of those families it's linked to a single variant of a single gene. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It turns out that when you go sequencing the general population, the genomes of the general population, like with this Thousand Genomes Project, you find that there are other people walking around with that same variant of that same gene, and they're fine. The exact. <laughs> and so Oops. these, what we thought were simple <laughs> genetic traits, yeah, turn right. out to maybe not be such simple yeah. genetic traits. Sure. And th this sort of variation is just out there in the population, and you you do you vaccinate thirty million people with a new adjuvant. Um, you may uncover something that was that you wouldn't have found otherwise. Here, here. And that is actually Nick's last point. What is the role of individual host genetic and age differences in response yes. to specific vaccines? So that's great questions. Yeah. And yeah. So we have some tools, but it's going to be a while. In the meantime, we grow eggs. <laughs> yeah. All right. Do, what do you guys think? Should we read a few emails or what? Uh, we're at an hour and a half now. What do you think, uh, Rich Condit? Uh, you know, you're the boss. You dude. read a few emails uh, already. But all right, we'll move on. Let's you did do them in context. And wrap it up. Yep. Okay. Yep. Next, next week we'll do some. Yep. Do you have a pick, Dixon? I do, actually, but it's wow. a, a pick of the future. <laughs> it's a pick of the Listen to this pick, and you'll see what I mean. The, the, AS, the AAAS meeting that's going to be held soon features the concept of beauty in science as well as functionality. 
And I think that's my pick of the week to look forward to that report. Because you can't do that. I can so. I just did it. Because <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think that some spectacular imagery will come out of this meeting that has already been expressed in various ways and various uh, you know, slides or advertisements for you know, immunological reagents that have fluorescence associated with them and stuff. But, but to see the preview for this meeting and to see the, the, the spectrum of beautiful imagery from the cellular all the way up to the whole organismal uh, and the graphic too will be very exciting to see what happens. And so that's my pick. My future pick of the week has that. Okay. Whatever you like, Dixon. That's what I like. I don't know what you like, Vincent, but that's what I like. (laughs) Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, So Grant McFadden brought this to my attention. There is a new word in the uh, medical literature, and it is repopulate. If you will recall, uh, must have been as as much as two years ago, uh, I had a pick about fecal transplants. Oh, yes, I remember. uh, To cure... um, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, C. C. Uh, C. Diff. 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 People who've uh, been on um, uh, high dose antibiotics and it screws up their microbial flora and then they don't uh, reestablish an appropriate flora and they get overrun with C. Diff and they have chronic gastroenteritis and yeah, it yeah. can be, it can kill you. It can be life threatening. That's true. Uh, yeah. And actually, there's been a, a new. Recently, a new, the first really controlled clinical trial uh, that says that this fecal transplant, which is to take fecal material from a healthy individual and introduce it into the colon of one of these individuals and reestablish their anormal intestinal uh, flora, uh, can cure this condition. It's fascinating. And the clinical trial uh, supports this very well. Well, it has... Uh, that has associated with it what some of the uh, writers have called an ick factor, right? Yeah, yeah. Like ick. Exactly. Right? So uh, uh, a group in uh, Canada um, who actually uh, studies the ecology of the gut um, uh, has come up with, has done some experiments where they can make a laboratory preparation that is supposed to, it's a mixture of bacteria that should appropriately represent uh, the normal gut ecology. And um, uh, they've done just a couple of patients where they've actually managed to uh, cure them by uh, giving them this stuff that they grow in the laboratory. And they've called the procedure repopulate. Repopulate, okay. (laughs) Uh, one of the interesting things is, uh, if you read this article, uh, almost as interesting as, as as the article is the machine they use to grow it. They call Robo Gut, right? Cool. Which is basically a chemostat. Yeah. Which is a, uh, a an incubator uh, where you can provide continuous input of nutrients uh, and a continuous output of whatever comes out the other end, <laughs> and continuously monitor. <laughs> Sounds the like a gut track. Get the pH and stuff right. <laughs> sure. And they've set this up to mimic what they think um, uh, conditions How are in the gut, How and they put into it. Uh, yes. human feces to start oh, with right uh, and then monitor what goes on so that's the way they uh, they make this stuff and right. at the so, at the conclusion of this research a couple of students were able to write up their feces <laughs> that's right <laughs> I'm sure that there are a myriad of jokes that yes come out. there are right there the are. video describing uh, the Robo gut is really nice I really like it huh yeah, this is good. This is uh, going to help a lot of I people. Love it. I love oh, it. absolutely. It's a great. Yeah. The cool great. thing is most of these uh, gut flora are not culturable, so this really is a way to try and culture those things. Right. Because you don't just want to put back the culturable microbes exactly. by, by pr- traditional methods. Exactly. So it's great. Alan, what do you have? I have um, uh, another humorous pick. Surprise, surprise. This is a little blog called WTF Evolution. And it is photos and and pithy little comments about examples um, where you just have to wonder. <laughs> is this like Darwin How Award? Is these, right. <laughs> How did these traits evolve? Oh, this is look just at this. Terrific. Oh, this is great. 
That first one, the gooey neck clams, I used to dig those in, um, oh, in yeah, California. Okay. okay, okay, okay. Right. I like the baboons. Yes. Well. Yeah, the baboon, that baboon has always reminded me of Jimmy Durante. <laughs> Put that thing away. This is great. <laughs> yeah. The neuter, well, the break. Look, this is why we don't anthropomorphize viruses. This is true. So we don't think these are pretty, but nature does. <laughs> well, you know. Yep. Or you don't even need to think it's about pretty. Oh, this the- is great. This looks like the guy from Star Wars. <laughs> uh, the Jabba the Hutt. Jabba. Jabba. This, yes. this blobfish. <laughs> this is great. That's yeah. the proboscis monkey. What about yeah. viruses? There must be some weird looking. Oh, well, you know the, the tagline. Name? Tagline for the blog is "Go home, evolution. You're drunk." <laughs> <laughs> no, it tries everything. Look at this. It tries thing. everything. This pelican. Hey, it looks like a urinal. Look at you this. Know, do you know the, the <laughs> Alan? You know the poem that goes with this one? Not that the pelican. Yeah, it's by Ogden Nash. Oh yes. Say it for us. I don't remember the poem. Hail to the large-billed pelican. His bill can hold more than his belly can. Nice. (laughs) The uh, rear end of the baboon is amazing. Well, it's there for a purpose. Yeah, put that thing away. Even the other baboon looks horrified. (laughs) All right, Dixon. See this geoduck or gooey duck? Yeah, Yeah, gooey duck. Do you think there are parasites of that? Uh, Oh, (laughs) absolutely. Ask ask Steve uh, Goff. He's studying parasites of clams right now as we speak. Yeah, that's right. He is. Be a retrovirus. Oh, there's tons of them, parasites. Yeah, tons of them. <laughs> the oh. wolffish is actually modeled after evolution's cousin, cousin Frank. Frank. <laughs> <laughs> the evolution guy has the... always secretly hated its cousin Frank. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Dear, dear. Good pick, Alan. So, you know, really you know what they it. call a camel? What? It's an animal designed by committee. Yeah. <laughs> So a horse designing guy committed. Now, a horse, that's, I'm sorry. You shouldn't look at it from our eyes. It's no, right. absolutely not. You think they're not laughing at us? You're crazy. <laughs> they don't laugh. We give them lots of things to laugh at. I don't about. think the wolf fish is laughing. Probably not. Uh, my pick is not anywhere near fun. <laughs> it's cool. It's a, uh, it's a simulation. It's, it's called Supercomputer Modu- uh, Modeling of Poliovirus. This is from Jason Roberts, who... I've been corresponding with for a while. He's at the Victorian Infectious Diseases Reference Laboratory in Australia. And they use a supercomputer to model viral capsids. And you may say, why do you need a supercomputer? Because they do what's called atomistic simulations, where they, they model the movement of the chains in short periods of time. Because, you know, crystal structure is kind of deceiving because... It shows a static view of a protein or a capsid. But in fact, the chains are moving, so they try to model this movement. And so their movies are beautiful, but they're, they're shaking because <laughs> the atoms <laughs> are Hold moving. that camera study. So this particular movie uh, is a composite of different things. And in fact, on the link, uh, you can see there's a, a list of what's going on. It starts out with a world map showing the movement of enterovirus 71. Then they do a simulation of polio. They show a cutaway. They show single so, ions moving around. Vince, when, really you, beautiful. when you... It's really cool. When you preserve neat. polio virus, does that stop that from moving? Uh, preserve it by... Formalin. Fixation. <clears throat> I doubt it. Why would it stop it? It's gonna, formalin it just cross, cross-links. Yeah, well, there's still going to be local movements. Surely. Yeah, these are atomic movements. This is like Brownian it. motion, right? Yeah, oh, yeah okay. exactly. Yeah. Or even quantum and, you know, you have lots of atoms here, so you need a supercomputer to do this. Wow. But they make some very, very beautiful images, okay. uh, which you can find at their website as well. Nice. It's on my cell phone right now, actually, one of them. Too. Outstanding. That beautiful image of polio. Cut away, and they also model the RNA inside it. It looks like a bunch of worms packed in. So as, as we're eradicating polio, you can flip on this movie and watch it tremble. <laughs> That's right. Watching it tremble. This is really cool, though. Um, we have a listener picks of the week. They were embedded in the emails, uh, oh. so I will just briefly read them. I had received three emails this week from Bjorn, from Megan, and from Marshall, who all sent links to the glass virus sculptures of Luke Jarum. Wow. And it turns out, I don't know why they all found it at once, but... Um, you know, this was a pick a while ago, mm. and we'll pick, let them pick it again. That's fine. But someone else sent me an email saying his entire collection was purchased by the Met. Oh, is that right? Yes. Nice. Here in New York City. Nice. Now, Luke must be very happy. I wonder yeah. why it wasn't published by the I have actually just 
today had some email correspondence with Luke. Really? No kidding. Yeah, because as we discussed in TWIV 50, where this first came up, his model of smallpox is inaccurate. Yeah. I don't I don't want to blame him for this, because I would have drawn the same thing years ago. So I uh, sent him an email and, um, uh, uh, you know, respectfully, yeah. Yeah. put it that way, uh, uh, told him what the differences were, and he wrote back to me. Yeah. Thanks for your email. I see I'll have to throw out my glass model and start again. Right. <laughs> you uh, might throw it my way. I'll take it. You might, yeah. you might say he blew it. Well, there thanks are, for, there thanks are. for the advice on this. I always knew that there were lateral bodies missing from my model, which my glass team were unable right. to insert. But now it seems the model needs to be far more complex. Back to the drawing board. Right. He says, thanks again for your respect for the truth and sharing your knowledge on this matter. That's kind regards, nice. Luke. How nice. Nice. You know, there's, nice. A, there's a collection of glass models of protozoans at the American Museum of Natural History. Oh, yeah. And wouldn't this make a nice um, juxtaposition exhibit at that museum and maybe on loan from the Metropolitan after yeah, they get their cool. collection set up? And I, ha I have to say, even if it's inaccurate, this thing is freaking cool. Oh, no, yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's fabulous. Yeah, it's well, hard. like I said, you know, a few years ago, I would have done exactly the same thing, huh. you know? Right. That's, it's not yeah, an unreasonable yeah. interpretation. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, it's basically the way the literature has interpreted it for a long time. Right. I think back when we picked him on TWIV 50, he actually did send an email or thanked us or did something uh, mm. of that sort. So he's sort of aware that we uh, did it. So we'll give him another bump. We'll give him another yeah, I'm still, in, uh, I'm still in correspondence with him, so I'll tell him that this is going to happen. I mean, he doesn't need a TWIV bump if he just sold his collection. If he just sold his collection to the Met. <laughs> where, where is he located, by the way? I don't remember. Maybe in Britain. Uh, uh, Luke, do you, is Luke Rich, Rich, do you know where he's located? Uh, no, I don't. Let's see. LukeJerum dot com. Um, he must make other glass models too. Oh, he's got viruses. nice lists of all his yeah. Uh, yeah. his uh, latest news acquired by the Met. Wow! Oh, the small the park. The small park artwork only mm. has been acquired by the Met, not uh -huh. the whole collection. Uh -huh. So, uh, I guess there's more than one uh, small pox. Maybe not, but the smallpox is going there. Where is he? Where is Luke? Let's see. Is there an about? Yes, here we go. Um, Luke. Oh, look, he's shaking the hands of the Queen. Yeah, he's, he's in the UK. He's in the UK. UK. The UK. Prince Philip and the Queen are shaking Luke's hands. This guy does not need a twiv bump. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everyone needs a twiv bump. Everyone needs a twiv bump. He'll be. It doesn't, he'll be, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't he'll matter. be prime minister next, especially if, if you're in smallpox. I mean, where's he got to go from here? So, Look, Sir Luke, what did he say? My glass people, Rich. Uh, yeah. What was that? My glass workers. He's got people doing this for him. Uh -huh. yeah. My sounds glass like, team. My sounds glass like Shahuli. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you'll be able to find this episode of TWIV at iTunes and at TWIV.TV, as usual. If you like us, go over to iTunes and leave a comment or a rating and subscribe. That really helps us a lot. If you have any questions and comments, send them to TWIV at TWIV.TV. Dixon de Palmier is a world traveler, but when he's <laughs> traveling, you can always find him at verticalfarm.com, trichinella.com. Org, is that it? Yep. And um, medicalecology.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. You're going to be here next week. You're going to Sweden, aren't you? I am. Linkoping. Linkoping. Uh, they're building. Gonna, that's Lynn Chirping. Lynn Chirping. You're absolutely right. And they're building a 14 story vertical farm. So I'll get farm. to see it. I'll get to see it. Does it have a 13th floor? I don't know. I'll let you know. Are you going to take pictures? Absolutely. You will. No, I can't. Do. It's total darkness over there during the winter. <laughs> <laughs> How are they running a vertical farm if it's total darkness? I, ah. well, I want to find that out, too. Mm, lights. It's the, the meeting I'm going to is called the uh, Urban Agricultural Summit. So I'll let you know. Alan Dove is at alandove.com and also on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. And Rich Condit. <laughs> Is at the University of Florida, Gainesville. You can find him at poxdoc.com. Thank you, Rich. You're quite welcome. So, Always a good time. This is great. No, it's not poxdoc.com. It's bit.ly slash poxdoc. Yeah, okay. Although you should buy the poxdoc. Uh, <laughs> Didn't we go through this thing. already? That was already taken. It is really? taken. Ah, oh, geez. Pox. 
Doc, doc, How com. dare they? Oh, it is Kodenkan Yudanashakai of Virginia. Really? I don't know who Kodenkan Yudanashakai His is. His webpage doesn't work. Maybe Sorry, he'll sell it to you for you were $10. Looking for could not be found. Ha. Huh. So he, the domain he may, it, to you. it might be available again. Maybe he didn't renew it. <laughs> Why would anyone buy Pox Doc unless exactly. you were a Pox virologist? Yeah, really. Right? Oh, well. That raises a good question. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>